And uh, settle in with us for the hour as our DEI experts delve into how global organizations tackle the most pressing issues in the practice area and share how their own stories on their path to creating a more inclusive workplace around the world. Now let's get to our speakers. Our first guest is taking the charge in creating organizational commitments as Otis Worldwide recently became an independent publicly traded company. While she's the head of global the global team there, her over 20 years as an HR professional and leader makes her an expert in functions such as business consulting, diversity management, compensation, employee benefits, and more. We are more than excited to welcome the Vice President of Global Talent at Otis Worldwide, Jennifer Amara. Good morning, Jennifer. Good morning today. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for having me today. Happy to have you. Our next guest has over 15 years of experience holding leadership DEI, talent management, and talent acquisition roles in corporate, state government, and higher education organizations. In her current role at Thomson Reuters, she develops and executes the organization's global DEI strategy, which spans over 24,000 employees in nearly 80 countries worldwide. And she's mm -hmm. passionate about connecting diverse talent and di disrupting bias. We swear this is not a plant either because she has her bachelor of science degree in psychology with a minor in neuroscience. So needless to say, she fits right in with us. Welcome the director of diversity and inclusion at Thomson Reuters, Elizabeth Nelson. Welcome to the show, Elizabeth. Thanks everyone. Next, I want to introduce one of NLI's best and brightest. She studied emotional functioning in people with neurodegenerative diseases at her PhD program at UC Berkeley. Her experience as a researcher leads our biggest projects at NLI translating social and neuroscience findings and distilling that information into learning solutions, research summaries, and journal articles to help organizations grow. And speaking of growing, she's an expert on growth mindset, speaking up power dynamics, and right now is helping to lead the charge on the science behind allyships and our solutions on the topic. She's a senior scientist and researcher here at NLI, Dr. Michaela Simpson. Hi, Michaela. Hello, Sade. It's so great to be here. And finally, leading today's discussion is a DEI expert with over 30 years of experience researching, strategy building, and consulting in the field. She has experience in leading diversity initiatives at Fortune 500 companies, serving on committees to better the field, and is a published author who has appeared on the international presenter and media stage. She's a cherry on top for today's discussion. And when she's not tirelessly working to improve DEI and organizations, you'll find her at the stables horseback riding. A warm welcome as I hand off the reins of the show to an NLI's director of our diversity and inclusion practice, Dr. Paulette Gerkovich. Paulette, off to you. Thank you so much. Good morning, afternoon, evening to all of you. It's great to be here. Are we ready to kick off? All right, let's go. Um, I wanted to start out by just telling you a bit about Neuroleadership Institute to frame the conversation uh, so you see a bit of where we're coming from. The Neuroleadership Institute has been around for over two decades. We were founded in Australia and now operate in over 24 countries. Or so we're truly a global organization that has advised over half of the Fortune 100 and many, many others. Um, we've published extensive amounts of research and do consulting and learning as well in three primary areas, performance management, culture and leadership, and of course, diversity, equity, and inclusion. So that's NLI. But today, we really want to focus on these two very accomplished corporate leaders that, that we're so privileged to have with us for the next hour. Uh, they're going to walk you through what their organizations have been doing in the global DEI space. So we'll spend the majority of our time hearing from them and allowing you to engage in some Q&A with them. But before we do that, I just wanna frame up today's discussion around some of the research in the global DE and I space. So the Society for Human Resource Management recently did a study of practitioners who were focused on global DE and I. And one of the mm -hmm. things they were very interested in was the connection between business and the DEI effort. So, so where, where and how was that link made? So they asked their participants, what of the following business rationale re uh, reasons are you focusing on DEI in your organization? And they really primarily focus 
on DEI across the globe because they want to get the best and the brightest, frankly. And this is probably not surprising whatsoever if you've spent even five minutes in the DEI space, right? The, the number one business reason for doing this is to get access to a broader talent pool. Also, to get closer to the customer or the client uh, is one of the primary reasons. Now, I think for Americans in the audience, the second most popular reason might be a little bit surprising, and that focuses on fairness, morality, ethics, simply doing the right thing. Now, we may in our hearts believe that this is the case, but very often in US companies, that's not where we focus when we talk about the business case. But if you're doing global DNI, and I learned this sort of the hard way, 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 way back in the day when I did my first speaking engagement in Norway, we don't always want to focus on the bottom line right out of the gate. In a lot of countries that have a very egalitarian cultural ethic, for example, focusing on a business rationale as it relates to ethics and doing the right thing for the entire population, not just your employees, is incredibly important. So you can see that that's reflected here in these survey results. And Paulette, could I just add something in, in terms of the, the science perspective? Mm -hmm. um, some social neuroscientists find that what, you know, on an individual level, what gets people to act, to speak up, or to engage in certain behaviors is when they look at a situation through what they call a, a moral lens or um, versus a pragmatic lens. And we look at something through a moral lens or what we say at NLI, you know, what is right versus what's easy. We're looking at how can we serve the greater good? How can we benefit our organization? How can we benefit our colleagues? So when people look at um, decisions through that lens versus what's in it for me, how can I benefit? That's not my fight, you know, through the pragmatic lens and they're less likely to step in and engage and make decisions um, where it impacts more people for the greater good. Such a great point. Thank you for sharing that, Michaela. I, I imagine we can even extend that argument, um, particularly given what's gone on in the past year and a half around the world and in the US. I think there really is um, an increasing acceptance to say, I am doing this for the right reasons. And P.S., it does so happen to affect the bottom line in a really positive way. We have over 200 studies now that show this, but this is also just a good, right thing. Um, and that argument does sway people. So thank you so much for bringing that up. In terms of where these efforts focus or the target audience, we're finding not surprisingly that women far and above are the number one target audience for global DEI efforts. And I say it's not surprising because it's the one category I think that's almost universal. Um, it's the most easy to define, of course. It's the most easy to measure across the globe. And we know that our senior leaders like to see measurement. They like to see numbers uh, when we're doing DEI. So women are the, that primary focus. And of course, for many obvious other good reasons, like we really have a lot left to do to advance women in the workplace and in, in the private uh, space as well. Ethnic minorities, um, what we would call race uh, in the US, visible minorities, for example, in Canada, indigenous peoples uh, in many countries, that's the second most common area to focus a DEI effort. After race and gender, the numbers in terms of a strong focus really start to plummet. So we see below 10% of organizations strongly focusing on things like age, ability, religion, sexual orientation. So clearly lots of work left to be done in these particular areas. And when Sherm asked these companies who participated where they were focusing their DE&I efforts, here's what they told us. Work-life balance was number one. I have to say this one surprised me. I really thought it would be widening the recruiting pool and focusing on ways to develop folks so that they had better opportunities to advance. But work-life remains at the top 
uh, followed by recruiting, usually some kind of training, sometimes around language, unconscious bias, um, lots in between, to appreciate cultural differences, overcome cognitive bias, and things of that nature. Fourth, most importantly, and I'm guessing this is more so in European countries, is something like an ombudsman's office. So that is an area where folks can go to talk to somebody confidentially about any type of problem or issue they might be having, work-related, personally, uh, et cetera, but very often focused on challenges that they might be having as a result of their identity uh, and its relation to getting development opportunities, advancement opportunities, and the like. Um, from there, the numbers start to drop off and we see things like goal setting, very popular in some places, again, Europe, California in the US, not so popular across the rest of the country monitoring supplier diversity spending and things of that nature. So to that end, we are very curious to hear from you in the chat where your primary challenges lie as you're thinking about global DE&I. So we've got lots of options here. Uh, feel free to respond to more than one. You can just click on the poll, uh, as many as apply. And then if there's something additional you wanna say in the chat about this question, feel free to do that. Just wanna get a pulse of from where the audience is coming around the biggest challenges you, your organization, envision or experience in the global DEI space. Okay. This is exciting. It's like watching track and field. The numbers are going up and down and all over the place. Translating concepts like inclusion and equity. Yeah. I've recently done some focus groups in Asia, for example, where that was a very, very big issue. Participants really pushed back um, on the concept of equity in particular um, and felt that that didn't quite apply to what they were thinking about and trying to do. It looks like understanding categories of diversity or demographics or constituencies is something else you're really struggling with and tying the effort to business goals. We do hear a lot of that as well. Lack of support from local leadership, which we know so important to being able to get traction with any global DEI effort. Okay, someone's not seeing poll results we're seeing in the chat. Shade, we I don't might know. Need, we might need to end poll for people to see. Okay, there we go. Can you see them now? All right, definitely translating the concepts of inclusion and equity is the big winner. And I think that and definitions of different demographic categories, getting local leadership support, um, getting the experience you need to uh, roll out a diversity effort globally are some of the things we'll hear about from our panelists today. So to quote Marty DeBerge and Spinal Tap, enough of my yakking, let's turn it over to our accomplished panelists and we'll hear from Jennifer first and about Otis's DE&I global journey. Thank you, Paulette. So I think I'll, I'll start by sharing a little bit about um, Otis for those of you that aren't familiar with us and where we're at right now really is, has defined our uh, DEI strategy. So we are a world leader in elevators, escalators, and moving walkways. We do everything the end to end. We design, manufacture, install, and service them. We have operations in 200 countries and territories and our employees uh, reside and work in 68 um, of those. You know, so needless to say, we are a highly diverse workforce on multiple dimensions um, with you know, um, role, experience, you know, educational background, race, ethnicity, language, culture. 
And we are also in a real state of transformation. We, in April of 2020, in the midst of the pandemic, we returned to our roots and became a publicly listed company on the New York Stock Exchange. It was uh, coincidentally 100 years after our initial listing in the New York Stock Exchange in 1920. But for the last several decades, we had been part of a conglomerate of industrials. And now we find ourselves a 168-year-old company that is a little over one year young again having built a corporate center, having to answer to different right, stakeholders, all at the same time that our industry and really every industry is going through a big digitization and the impact of digital technology on our business. And so we are working really in transforming into a smart software industrial. At the same time, we're going through our, um, the change of being a publicly traded company. So this has a lot of implications for the workforce, the work we're doing um, to drive those results. We, every day, so we talk about ourselves internally as being globally local. <laughs> These are two terms that are really, it's really an important balance for us. Decisions are made locally on the ground. That's where our customers are, right? Employees that yet yeah, we're doing it in this global context, you know, now. So that really required us to redefine, and we kind of went through this a year before spin, to define what are our core values and the behaviors right required to drive that. And so inclusion, empathy, um, empowerment, and collaboration became absolutely critical, along with the pace and imagination required um, to innovate right, and, and, and transform. And what we found, you know, a couple months in from becoming public and two years in of working kind of the, those uh, culture values or core values, we found ourselves in the mid pandemic, right? Our employees were going through um, the impact of the pandemic, our customers, our business. We uh, were living through in our communities and in our, you know, with our colleagues, the um, results of that and the result of, you know, social unrest and a whole bunch of other things going on globally. And our CEO and our executive and her executive leadership team, you know, we sat down and said, you know, what are we going to do? And we, they came up with um, a program of commitments to change around centered around DE&I and around our inclusive culture and the culture that we desire. So we're now kind of one year in from that. We've made strong progress um, on all of them and we're revisiting them to say, what are we gonna do next? This is what led us to our partnership with NLI, who uh, such a valuable partnership. We've learned so much and grown so much as an organization through this. And we, working with NLI brought all of our people leaders, 8,000 of them, through um, training um, and, and learning sessions to both identify and mitigate bias and to make effective business and people decisions within that context. We've now um, been rolling that out to the remaining uh, 61,000 colleagues across the globe and are embedding sustain, you know, making it sustainable across the different pieces of our uh, talent life cycle. So Paulette, that's where, that's uh, what we're working on and where we're at. That's fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing, Jennifer. Um, this is tough stuff and it sounds like you're doing an amazing job, particularly through uh, the changes that you've gone through in a very difficult, probably the most difficult year um, any of us have experienced in our lifetimes. Um, Elizabeth is uh, representing another organization that's gone through a lot of change and has done some really interesting work in this global DNI space. Incredibly impressive stuff. Elizabeth, why don't you share um, with our audience some of the things that you're doing at Thomson Reuters? Yeah, I would love to. So as we think about Thomson Reuters footprint and to ground folks in what we do, if you're not familiar with our organization, we are um, 
essentially a technology and content company at the heart of what we do, really powering professionals that work in areas like legal, tax and accounting, corporations, compliance, government, and media, and making sure that they have access to tools, resources, and content to make the best business decisions to advance the work that they're doing within those markets. As we think about our global footprint, as Sade mentioned in, the, in my introduction, we are very uh, geographically dispersed. About 50% of our employees are in North America and 50% of our employees in other locations across the world with um, you know, really significant regional um, footprint in APAC, in EMEA, um, and in Latin America in particular. Now, as we think about our global diversity and inclusion strategy, one thing zooming out of that a little bit and based on some of the poll questions um, and feedback that had come through thus far is that I know um, one of the highest areas as Paulette um, was kind of recapping is tying DEI efforts to our business goals. And particularly at Thomson Reuters, our CEO has made a commitment that one of our top three business priorities as an organization is ensuring that we're advancing our inclusive culture of world-class talent. So Paulette mentioned, you know, as we think about the why behind some of this work, a lot of it is around bringing in talent, advancing talent, and ensuring that there's a sense of equity, inclusion, and belonging so that we can continue to grow and develop that talent in meaningful ways. And so folks can really expand their career um, and move around our organization a lot of different ways to meet our customer needs. So as we think about that, that's really what grounds our work and that's what sets the precedent and the priority and the accountability for the work that we do in the global DEI space. Beyond that, specifically within our DEI strategy, we focus on three main pillars of work. The first being inclusive workplace, the second being diverse talent, and the third being customers and brand and making an impact in the markets in which we operate. So as we think about it and kind of unpack that of what we're aligning to within each of those focus areas, um, one really big piece that we're doing within diverse talent is building a lot of transparency and accountability for advancing diverse talent representation across our global footprint. So we've made three external commitments that are included in the social impact report that Nick shared in the chat section that really focus on um, advancing women's representation, advancing racial and ethnic representation across our organization, and in, um, increasing our Black talent representation as well. It was really important for us to really share the vision globally of where we were looking to grow and where we were looking to see increased representation. Now, what that doesn't mean is that that doesn't mean we're not still focusing on LGBT, uh, LGBT plus inclusion representation, disability representation, other facets of diversity, but it is giving some focus and you know, really where do we have a spotlight and where do we wanna see some very significant growth while we're working on the wider um, kind of panoramic view of facets of diversity across Thomson Reuters, or as I say, TR for short. Um, to bring that to life in a really meaningful way, we've really focused on increasing transparency. So how do we bring our employees along that journey with us? How are we building transparency and understanding where we are, where are our gaps and opportunities in that space? And again, how are we trending towards that goal at the end of the day? Um, in organizations that I've worked in in the past before coming to Thomson Reuters a little over four years ago, it was DEI data kind of sat in, you know, in certain people's roles, there's very limited access. And that's certainly, we don't provide access to everyone everywhere. But as we think about our high level goals and where we wanna see progress, we're sharing with our employees on a monthly basis, how are we trending towards that? So they're not just hearing about it once a year, they have readily access to that based on our diverse talent representation goals. And we're continuing to look to increase that transparency even more. Um, the second piece is, you know, as we think about um, our inclusive workplace and how we're looking to drive progress in that space, we're getting really specific around um, what data do we have and how do we expand the completeness of data around our employee demographics globally? So for example, it's pretty common if you're an employer in the US, you will provide an opportunity for your employees to self-identify different diversity demographics. And you can then use that data to power a lot of analytics in this space. So looking at you know, your employee surveys, disaggregating data by diverse talent communities, looking at talent flow, and a gap that we had as an organization um, that we worked really um, 
really, really focused efforts on beginning in August 2020 is expanding employee self-ID across our global footprint. So in uh, July and August, we offered employees the opportunity to self-ID, for example, race and ethnicity in only six countries, US, Canada, Brazil, Puerto Rico, South Africa, and the UK. Yet, as I mentioned, we have employees in um, you know, over 80 countries across the, the globe. So what we did is we focused um, on expanding self-ID. We now ask race and ethnicity self-ID questions in um, nearly 50 countries in which we operate, making sure that it was legally viable for us to do so, that we were made, um, meeting all of the privacy and compliance requirements in that space, and that there weren't criminalization of certain facets of um, identity like LGBT, in which we um, still see in some of the countries in which we operate. That has provided us a significant increase in foundational employee data for us to then get deeper insights into how we're trending in the space. Again, deeper insights into the um, areas of opportunity, missed opportunities, and really diagnosing that in a meaningful way and uh, putting interventions against that and really understanding the uniqueness of our employee experience outside of a North America lens, which is where that data tends to exist in a lot of companies in a really robust um, way. So I think that's been foundational for us to advance this work differently as we think about it across our global footprint. Um, the success of that, one thing that I wanted to point out because um, one of the, the top results, right, was translating concepts like inclusion and equity globally, understanding diversity definitions and categories in different countries is uh, the power of that work and our ability to do that work with speed came from working directly with our employees and our leaders across those countries. So it wasn't DEI as a team or our stakeholders that we pulled together as project managers defining that. Instead, we really leaned into empathy research and focus groups directly from our employees in that space. So it wasn't just a copy and paste of what are the census options in Thailand around race and ethnicity? We then took that back to employees in the region to verify that. Are we missing anything? And we got some really incredible feedback from our employees that helped us bring the right values to our employees so that they could self-ID in a meaningful way and see the options, um, their identity reflected in the options in which we provided. So a good example of that is we had an employee working in Hong Kong who is Canadian, who identifies um, with a particular race and ethnicity that we didn't have in that space. We were able to work through and rapidly iterate around what those options look like. And for us, it's really about progress, not perfection in this space. How do we continue to see progress? How do we openly ask for feedback from our employees around what's resonating or not? And then from there, continue to iterate and grow as we look towards that forward goal and continuing to create that momentum versus it just being a moment in time. I could talk about this all day. I know that we've got lots to cover throughout the conversation. Feel free to drop questions in chat if you have any um, questions about that specifically, but those are some of the things that we're really leaning into that power then our overarching strategy, as I mentioned, around diverse talent, inclusive workplace and customers and brand. Back over to you, Paulette. Thank you so much. And yes, please do feel free to drop questions in the chat. This is an incredibly unique opportunity, honestly, one I wish I'd had when I was a practitioner uh, to ask questions about how to tackle what can be a pretty difficult kind of change management process. Uh, some of the questions that I had on my mind were, how, how do you determine for each of you where you're going to specifically focus your efforts? So as you sort of start out in creating your strategy, for example, how do you know where to point uh, directionally what you're going to be doing? I think um, for us, that was really part of these commitments that we laid out was first identifying, um, and this is part of being an authentic leadership team. They, they said, you know, we don't know what we don't know. And they brought it, uh, we brought in an independent, um, we had an independent review of all of our talent practices, seeking input on where, right, should we make some revisions and where should, um, where should we, where do we perhaps um, 
leaving the door open for biases and what should we, um, how should we prioritize that? So I think, and, and then sharing that, you know, with the entire workforce um, and now sharing the updates, right, on what we've learned and what we're now changing um, is, part, is part of it, Paulette. I'd also say we, again, I described our workforce for a reason <laughs> to say in order for us to embark on this work, figuring out the measurement, you know, all these different things, we knew that we needed a common language and mindset around why we're doing it. Um, Michaela, you brought up some of the research earlier about how important having that basis, right, of why we're doing this work, how important that is to move. And so, um, you know, in, embarking on the partnership with NLI was really around building that common mindset and language for us then to do the work on. It was a key foundational element. That's great, thank you. And at Thompson Reuters, I think it's both a, a it tends to be a, both a qualitative and quantitative approach to where we focus. So um, from a quantitative perspective, we'll look at, you know, where is our, our global employee footprint? Where do we have opportunities and gaps in terms of whether it be repre representation, whether it's around, um, learning, where are we looking to grow as an organization, where are we forecasting our hiring or where we're forecasting, you know, our leadership teams to be, our location strategy. Um, it might be inputs um, that we see based on, um, you know, from a qualitative perspective, things like leaders coming to us and, and you know, essentially knocking on our door, sending a us a message saying, hey, I've got a lot of energy around this, and this is something that I'm really committed to for my team or a part of our business, um, a business leader saying, hey, this is a commitment that I'm making. I wanna see you know, marked improvements around my organizational health index and my sentiment of employees around their feelings of inclusion and belonging. Um, so it's a bit of a, a both and approach. The data piece, how we define that, how do we focus in? The nice part about doing um, it from a data perspective is we can then find a few markets to test in, in terms of employee populations. Uh, get some really great success stories and wins, and then expand from there. Oftentimes, that helps us disrupt the mindset of this, this doesn't work for my region, or this might not make sense. We'll start to uncover um, what is some of the safety bias at play within that space, um, or what are some of the you know, mindsets and behaviors that we need to look to shift in testing something new. And oftentimes, if we can test it in a market with some of the, um, the what seem like to be apparent similar constraints and have wins that helps us get across um, the finish line a little bit faster in different places. Um, but fundamentally, it is that that both and approach. And we're con constantly um, getting feedback from our employees as well. We have a collaboration board that we started over the last few months with our business resource groups and members from those groups, along with leaders from those groups and their executive sponsors, mm -hmm. where at any time they can drop in feedback into this collaboration board, whether it's um, based on the diverse talent community they represent or our pillars within our DNI strategy. And so we've got that continual feedback loop as well, so we can rapidly shift. It's not something that we put in place in January and hope we're pointing in the right direction come December something that is iterating every month and every quarter. Yeah, that's really interesting. So if if I were to bring together everything that I'm hearing, it, it's really sort of a mini master class in how to do change management incredibly well. So there's that creating the common language or the common pillars around which you can uh, rally, looking at the data, identifying the challenges and responding to those, but also, looking to your employees and to leadership to hear what they think the issues are, where they have energy and passion, because you've got to have that support. Um, and then continuing to evolve, because no good diversity initiative just sits there and stays static. So it's fantastic to hear from both of you um, how you're continuing to reshape these efforts as you learn. Um, from your employees in particular. We've got yeah, lots right? of questions yeah. coming in. So yeah, I was just monitoring the, the chat. We have so many questions. 
hopefully we'll be able to get to them. I just wanted to lead off with something and, and I would love to um, hear Jennifer and Elizabeth, their perspective on this, I have a little bit to share on this as well. Somebody wrote that um, a challenge for me around DE&I efforts in South Africa is that there is no psychological safety. So people are not willing to engage how can we overcome this challenge? And before I throw that question out to you, I just uh, would like to define what, what, what uh, does psychological safety mean? We actually have a slide on this. Um, it's a climate in which people feel safe expressing their ideas, concerns, sharing ideas even, mentioning mistakes um, without fear that they're going to you know, be shamed or they're gonna feel embarrassed or they're going to face retribution. And this is from Amy Edmondson's work at Harvard. So she's written a lot on this. And so it's really important that organizations create a climate of psychological safety. Otherwise people are not going to feel safe um, bringing their authentic selves, let alone just mentioning things and bringing to light, especially issues around DE and I. And Elizabeth, um, uh, maybe you could share um, some of your perspectives, um, Jennifer, you as well. Yeah, so what comes to mind um, is really building that trust and that feedback loop with employees. I think that's where we're starting to see the biggest gains around psychological safety. So um, for example, I mentioned empathy research and focus groups being really important as part of our approach and how we advance our DEI strategy or align in the initiatives or interventions that we want to test. Now, to get to that point, we'll solicit feedback from employees. But as mentioned in chat, if your employees don't have the trust or psychological safety, how do you know that you're getting all of the data points and that quantitative feedback that you're really looking for? And so we start often with a space of building trust of um, being a trusted advisor, being a source, being someone who will continue the conversation and feedback loops and um, inviting voices to the table um, and them getting to see when other people are contributing and sharing how do we take that information? How do we protect confidentiality where it needs to be protected and when it needs to be protected? And how are we making progress so that they can see ideas just don't go into a black hole or feedback doesn't go into you know, nowhere and that it's not taken action on, but they're really able to see that progress real time as we move throughout the calendar year. And I think that's where the psychological safety starts to grow. We also understand, um, try to understand from a, a local cultural context, what are the operating norms within that office, that work culture, the communities in which we live and work, and make sure that as we go about our approach to um, building empathy research, to building those um, communication feedback loops, all of those pieces, that it's done with not just a North America lens pressed on the rest of the world and how we do business in our work culture here in North America, but really what makes sense from that local context. Um, tends to work out best for us. And again, it's a little bit around trial and error and having this kind of shared humanity and humility when we get it wrong, because we don't always get it right. We'll get really critical feedback from our employees and this didn't land with me. This didn't feel safe. This didn't really meet my needs. And I think being open to that critical feedback um, has been really helpful as well and saying like, hey, we recognize we got it wrong, or that didn't work, let's pivot our approach for this next session. Um, and that's where we're starting to see those gains. Hope that helps. Hi, um, thank you, Elizabeth. There's so much so much in there. Um, I would start with, in our business, and in, you know, in our um, industry, safety is an absolute, because our so many of our jobs are really high risk, installing elevators, manufacturing. Um, and so we've partnered with our environmental health and safety right team around this concept, recognizing that we can't even have, you know, physical safety without psychological safety. They, we even, you know, so even the basis of our safety program is, hey, if you see something that's not safe, you, you are empowered as an individual employee to stop work. Right. Or, you know, I can, I can go on and on, but that basis then and that being ingrained um, in our culture as an absolute, I think, has helped us here as well. And a lot of um, these concepts that we're introducing, we're doing it within the context of our safety program as well, because if folks don't feel psychologically safe, then they're not actually physically safe um, in our workplaces. We've also done uh, another piece of this, I would say, is our senior leaders 
absolutely modeling authentic leadership. It's a conscious effort. You see it even in this um, public, you know, commitment to change and on and on. And I think that that helps create um, an environment. We've also introduced different programs that um, create the space for, for folks um, to come forward, you know, to have these open conversations. We started a program in the US uh, called Breaking Bread, Breaking Barriers, where you come together, talk about tough topics in a large group, break out into small groups. It's based on <clears throat> research, Michaela, some of the research you've even <laughs> put together. We've now, that you just shared with us, and we've, and we've um, moved that into, um, we've deployed it in 10 other countries under a different nomenclature, something that fits right the culture and the language um, there. But it's a, it's a conscious effort and it's, it's, it's hard work. Jennifer, you bring up a really good point. I mean, the more you can embed, um, you know, a culture around psychological safety within the workplace and shared values and mindsets and behaviors and language, I think that's where you start to see um, kind of the exponential gain. So at Thompson Reuters, we've got mindsets and behaviors for all employees around um, being customer obsessed, challenging committing, and a growth mindset. And that helps us um, have this kind of shared understanding and, and ways in which we can work together. And then for our leaders, it's around model, coach, and care. And again, what is that accountability then aligned to those mindsets and behaviors? And then we connect everything else that we do, whether it's how we're mitigating bias and decision-making through partnering with NLI on breaking bias, that shared language, and we connect it with our mindsets and behaviors and other ways in which we talk about our work culture. And that starts bringing it into um, a bit more of the norm versus it feeling like um, I go about my daily work and in certain situations I need to code switch. We're not asking for folks to code switch. We're asking folks to, um, to lean into these shared values, mindsets, behaviors, and so forth. So, and I, and I would just add, I would just add allowing the space for it to, to for employees to build it. So the, the program that I mentioned uh, breaking Bread, Breaking Barriers, that was started by one of our employee resource groups. It's now a program we've adopted, like I said, in 10 other countries, but that was an employee resource group came forward and said, we want to do this. You know, we provided them the resources they need needed to, to research and, and create it, you know, and implement it. And I think the more you can empower employees to do things like this on their own versus, right, it coming from the company, you're also creating psychological safety. And maybe the Jennifer, you, you tapped into one of the questions that somebody had mm -hmm. about incorporating um, cultures and indigenous cultures and, um, uh, you know, any insights into the incorporation of ceremonies and protocols in terms of indigenous employees um, so that an organization is not in unintentionally adopting a DEI approach that perpetuates colonial mindsets. Um, and so it sounds like your organization is being mindful and like letting it in, in part be employee driven that it's not just, and which is another question about, you know, the, the, mm -hmm. the business case for DE&I, it's almost like, where's mm -hmm. the human case? And I'm hearing you're making a human case for DE&I and you're incorporating people into that. Absolutely. That's it. And, and giving them the space, but also the resources to, you know, create what you know what they need all of our employee resource groups have a budget um, and support for whatever it is that they want to go after for their colleagues in the company thank you so much you know there are amazing questions coming in i hope we have time to to get to a bunch more they seem to be falling into two categories uh there are a lot of questions around sort of the technical components or how you do dni on a global basis and then there's a whole set around culture and mindsets and behaviors um i'd love to actually get a take a question from that first category, because I think we've not touched on that yet. Um, there were some questions around accountability, for example, like how do you ensure accountability, especially when we're talking about such a, a large expanse um, of stakeholders and employees? I mean, we're literally talking about doing this around the globe. Um, how do we make sure it happens? So for um, us at Thomson Reuters, it's really embedding diversity and inclusion into our operational processes or our business processes. So for example, from an accountability standpoint within our leadership teams, 
our operating committee, so our CEO and his direct reports and those leadership teams meet regularly, making sure that looking at the data around our progress in this space is part of those business meetings and done regularly is, is the way in which we're driving progress there. Additionally, our HR stakeholders um, hadn't always had easy access to this data or um, shared methodologies and ways to analyze the data. And the data sets are huge and we're not all data scientists, even though I'm a, a data nerd self-proclaimed at heart, that may not be everyone's expertise. So we've leveraged tools and technology. Tableau is a really great example in which our data teams can help us create you know, a standardized dashboard for looking at the data. And our HR um, stakeholders who are working with our business leaders and other folks who are driving progress in this space on a day-to-day, week-to-week, month-to-month basis can access the data on demand, real time, filter it in meaningful ways to find what they need and easily export it and bring it into business team and leadership team meetings. And so um, again, operationalizing that, making it easy and leveraging technology to bring that to life has helped us be a bit more successful. Now, if you're not a big conglomerate like Thompson Reuters and might not have access to you know, all of those tools and technology, I would say fundamentally, it's making sure that um, this is part of your business as usual. So again, you know, as you're um, consulting with your business leaders and setting their goals and strategies, how is this baked in there and how are you coming at it regularly? And your business reviews, not just about revenue and market growth or other key indicators that you might be looking at, but how is DEI at the table and being talked about? How are your talent conversations going? Are you looking at talent from a diversity, equity, and inclusion lens? Are you disaggregating data in meaningful ways? Some of that can happen in spreadsheets. I've spent much of my career doing that in spreadsheets and not fancy tools. Um, but I think prioritizing that is a really great place to start. Brilliant. Thank you. Jennifer, did you want to jump in here um, and talk a little bit about accountability at Otis? Yeah, and I, I'll just mirror what Elizabeth shared is the, just the, the data and, in, and, and the constant use of data is so critical. So we, again, in, in preparation to become a public company, we embarked on every single one of our countries that we were operating on as kind of their own data sets, their own payroll, their own, you know, we had no really way to get a quick handle on the data of our, um, of our workforce. And so we have, but we now do, as of two months ago, we now have one common platform and book of record for all of our employees, and it's integrated across the different, um, the, uh, the different talent lifecycle processes, compensation, um, our talent reviews, our succession planning, recruiting, so we can, and data and <laughs> the analytics that we knew we needed was part of the requirements of setting up you know, that platform. So we now are able to look globally at the global level all the way down to a very local level and embed that in our practices, including our uh, business reviews and our, you know, uh, what we bring to the board of directors and what we bring to our monthly and quarterly business reviews, data around the e and and our workforce and what's happening. Um, so I would just reiterate Elizabeth's point of that is uh, critical to yeah. doing this work and practicing this work it, it, in order to hold folks accountability, hold folks accountable and understanding where we're making progress. You, you know, and so you're both very clearly focusing on the use of data mm -hmm. and technology, but what, uh, what else strikes me as a common thread through your answers is the embeddedness into the business of what you're doing. That I think is a key ingredient to the success that you're seeing, really making sure DEI and the business are closely integrated. So interesting. Michaela, I think there was a question you wanted to address. Right, there's one on trust. How do you ensure that issues such as trust actually happen? I see silos in our large organization that initiatives are not focused on the employee. And just to kind of backtrack and just kind of um, take a, a, a kind of a, a bird's eye view of trust and accountability. These are themes um, that I've heard both of you talk about trust, accountability, transparency, and how they're all really tied together. And, you know, being accountable, uh, that's doing what you say. 
um, you know, that's going to engender trust in people. When people feel they can trust their organization, they're more likely to stay, they're more engaged. Um, you know, there are many ways you can show trust about, you know, being competent. And that issue about transparency, sharing information so that people know what's happening, and then acknowledging maybe where, oh, we said we were going to do this and this didn't happen, but acknowledging that and like we're working to do better, you know, adopting that growth mindset and how critical that is. Um, for or an organization and the people in the organization. So I just wanted to kind of create that frame before I pass it on to, to you um, to address this, this question from your perspectives. Yeah, I would, I would um, totally echo that. And I think, you know, the question that we ask, um, or, or I look at least to ask our employees quite often is, like, what does success look like for you? How do you want to be communicated? How, you know, really understanding the, the variety of our individual's needs so that we can start to be much more internal, customer-centric in how we do the work that we do and that it's not a one-size-fits-all. So I regularly ask that so that I'm not making assumptions or kind of casting my shadow of how I, I do business and like to be interacted and collaborated with on others in that space. Yeah, and, and I think I'll just add one quick, another, it's, somewhat a tactic, but it's been a very helpful one, is embedding this in our employee survey. So we survey all employees globally twice a year, um, 10 questions, 12 questions in each um, survey, including open-ended ones, and we have the ability to do a lot of analytics just on those global comments, um, and ensuring that the questions that we're asking um, are getting at this point of trust, even, even the ones that aren't explicitly asking about it. Trust and, and, and trying to measure through the engagement survey how our employees are feeling about whether or not we're an inclusive um, culture and whether we're practicing what we are talking about. It's been very helpful. Yeah, it's so interesting. And I, I, uh, I have been so intrigued. I didn't even realize until one of my colleagues virtually tapped me on the shoulder and said, we're almost out of time. It feels like this has gone by in 10, 15 minutes. Amazing. Um, just thank you so much, um, both Jennifer and Elizabeth for your incredible wisdom in this area, for sharing your experience. I know this isn't easy stuff. Uh, there are ups and downs and, and you've been candid um, about what you've gone through to get to this place. So very appreciative. And Michaela, of course, thank you for your wisdom uh, and your great questions.